you probably have to say yes. And um, we'll get started. So this is the, uh, the monthly meeting of the Combined Oregon Carvers Guild and the Carving Special Interest Group of the Guild of Oregon Woodworkers. So welcome all. We've been doing this now for I think six, 16 months. Um, and I'm gonna ask you all, if you're not muted to mute yourself, a few of you aren't, uh, that would help just in case. Um, Eric, maybe I'll just ask you to mute yourself too, just momentarily, then I'll have you have you come back on. I'm gonna make a few announcements. We have a couple of show and tell slides and then we'll get started. Um, most of you should know by now, we are not doing a December program. All of our experience over the last couple of decades is December is kind of crazy for most people. So we tend not to do that. We, do, we don't do it. So in January, Chuck Reinhardt is the speaker at the program. He's going to do a slideshow and talk of his trip to the UK that he did with Mary May's group to look at the Grindling Gibbons thing that she did. Chuck is uh, one of our resident uh, instructors. He's been teaching for a long time. He's uh, in his early 90s now and great help and looking forward to being able to teach some more for us. But he's also a great photographer and I previewed the slides with him and uh, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be really worth, worth doing. And if you haven't been blown away by Grindling Gibbons, you'll probably will learn a lot and hopefully it won't dissuade you from trying carving because it's so intimidating. Uh, in February, our speaker will be Kelly Stadelman. Kelly is unknown to a lot of you, but she is a big deal. Uh, she taught in Oregon, she taught carving between 1995 and 2008 out of a studio in North Plains. And uh, she at one time had five carving instructors teaching for her and then another couple teaching painting. And eventually she morphed into a interior design shop as well as a carving studio called Heritage Art Studios. 2008 put a kibosh on that. She wrapped up shop and she moved into a huge pole barn shop that's to die for. And I had met her only within the last year and uh, tried to ask her and she agreed to get re-engaged a bit. And the biggest project she's ever done is a five foot high crucifix for her Catholic church in North Plains. And she had a photo album of the photos that show this entire process of doing a significant carving. And she, so we just videotaped that and we're putting that together with the slides and the photos. And so she will do a, we'll do a video presentation of that. It'll be about 45 minutes long. And then there'll be a Q and A with her. So I think those two are really are really going to be good. Uh, Terry Burnside is uh, teaching a two segment class on carving Santas out of basswood eggs. Uh, that class filled up. There's a couple on the wait list. We hope to do another one and a variation. He was been teaching uh, wood spirits classes, and this is sort of part of that same genre. And he will be doing hopefully more facing some back surgery that'll put him out of commission for six weeks. So it'll probably be after the new year. Uh, we're doing the, uh, I'm doing the monthly in-size carving class for beginners, a free two and a half hour experience to try to get people who have never carved before to do something simple with one tool. And we're learning as we go. Uh, it's been quite, uh, quite a good experience. So that's going on. The Mac Sutter relief carving classes are still going on. The eighth session is underway. That started last, uh, this time a year ago. And there'll be an advanced Max Sutter one that's been posted on the website for doing something, uh, project number four in a series of 12 uh, out of um, Walnut, but using some different, uh, a little bit different variations than Mac did. And then Roger Crooks, who is online uh, is, uh, on our board is putting together a sharpening for beginners class and document and videos. And we hope to do that as an ongoing monthly, at least monthly or bi-monthly class that would uh, uh, help people get started on the carving journey because it's an endless, endless kind of a journey. Um, we had two people submit um, Show and tell, let me just bring that up. 
Hang on a minute. There we go. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, Tom, are you, if you're here, could you unmute yourself? Tom Bundy is a longtime friend of the clubs and an active participant in a variety of ways, lives in central coastal California. And uh, he was in a, he had some show and tell work in uh, our July program uh, that was significant. And Tom sent these in about an hour ago. I don't, I can't see everybody now. Tom, are you, if you're here, you have an opportunity to say what these are about. Yeah, it's a, a 50 inch tall gnome and a 30 inch tall uh, mushroom out of redwood, 17 inches wide. Somebody wanted them for their yard, so I did it for them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, the, the first picture shows them under the gazebo. It looks like under a trolley. Yeah, that's where, that's where they ended up being. Yeah. Okay. Chainsaw carved, hand carved, mixture? Uh, it started with chainsaw and then uh, grinding tools. Okay. Chisels, chisels and gouges and stuff don't work with redwood very good. Wow. So. And how did you finish it? It looks, uh, doesn't look reddish, it looks brownish. Did you, is yeah. it natural? Uh, no, that's, uh, it's, it's for log homes and stuff. I, I called a place that sells stuff for log homes and this is what they recommended. Okay. Prolux uh, Cedal One. Say that again? It's, it's called Prolux Cedal One. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Uh, the next slide is from Jordan McElroy. Macauer. Uh, jo Jordan, I don't know if you're here. Uh, I can't see again. Jordan is in the Silicon Valley Carving Club in the Bay Area, and uh, he fell in love with carving linoleum and doing block printing. And he's got a massive output. And in the world of carving, when you think about not everybody likes what you like or likes what I like, but the diversity is absolutely amazing. And, uh, you know, to think that somebody, whatever you, whatever you like to do. So Jordan, just a, a chance. Are you here by any chance? The nice thing about linoleum printing is that it's grainless. And so it um, offers opportunities for uh, that you might not otherwise experience. Carving um, ice is an option. Carving golf balls is an option. Roman who is here, uh, showed us about food carving, grainless food carving. And we joked about, you know, it's another use for zucchini. Uh, certainly Halloween pumpkin carving is, is an example of that, but you know, not everybody has to carve exactly the same style of the same wood. But what unites us usually is our design issues, inspiration issues, art issues, tools, sharpening, marketing, having fun meeting people. Um, when it, any, I assume if you have any comments in general, the way the program always work is if you have questions for tonight, uh, please put them in chat. I will monitor that and Roger will ask if you can help monitor that just in case I lose track of, of some of that. And I'll try to feed that into uh, to Eric. Eric is here tonight from Boise uh, I, because of Doug Rose and Doug is here. Doug, you can wave as you, you are here, Doug. I was sitting in on the, the Don Bear program that we had in January, February, uh, and through the bird carving world. And then he introduced us, or introduced me to the Idaho Carvers Guild. And I've been hanging out just a little bit with them. I met Eric, I have a personal interest because my daughter lives in Boise. And so I'm trying to deal with that, deal with that. So Eric is, got a multi, is the multi-talented. I'm gonna spotlight him. And so now you're on big camera, Eric. Uh, I, I uh, asked him, Oh, he, we, I met him. I thought Eric was coming through Portland last summer to teach a class that he does almost every year in Salem. So we had an opportunity to show him the Guild Shop, Multnomah Art Center, and eat at Otto's in Multnomah, Art, Art, uh, in Multnomah Village. I'm hoping that Eric will be able to come to Portland and teach for us. 
He's teaching extensively in, or fairly extensively in, in Boise and elsewhere. And maybe as he talks about his background, he can talk about that. But he has a, a lot to offer and he uh, agreed to talk on the topic of tips and techniques based on his teaching and carving experience. And uh, he's got a long, long outline. So I will let him have the microphone and ask everybody else to mute and we'll monitor chat. And then Eric, I'll just ask, that you know, as as you go through, maybe take pauses, and we'll encourage people to use chat. I'll feed them to you or ask questions. And audience, everybody in the audience, please please think of questions. I mean, this is sometimes where a lot of the extra added value comes from because the questions you have are frequently what others have as well. Okay, Eric. Well, Larry, thank you for having me. I, I, again, I. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about carving as anybody who's ever spent any time with me knows I can talk forever. So um, if, if my sound gets off or the camera gets off, somebody give me a wave or a thumbs up or a thumbs down and I'll do my best to, to adjust as needed. But I, I enjoy carving. I've done it for a long time uh, in comparison to what, what else I've done. I've, I've been carving now since about 2006 or seven. Uh, and and I I come to carving in a in a in a long, lot of different ways. I started like many of you did with Boy Scout carving, and so that's where that's where I started getting into faces, and that's my primary focus. I really enjoy carving faces, and in particular caricature carving faces. So um, I, I I was lucky enough to join the Idaho Wood Carvers Guild, and we have some wonderful carvers in in all sorts of genres chip carving, bird carving, caricature carving. We've got several members that have been or are still are members of the Caricature Carvers of America, for those of you that uh, that, that pay attention to that kind of stuff. And so we've got a long history. And so I've got I've got people that I've, I've been able to learn from and, and, and enjoy time with. So as I said, my primarily my primary focus is caricatures and, and I do animals as well. Uh, and but I mostly focus on humans and I the 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 shelves you see behind me are full of carvings that are finished and I don't know what to do with them because I'm done with the head and now the, the the plan is if the head's four inches tall how tall is the body going to be so I have boxes of these heads sitting around that I've carved and sometimes I give a few away as as a gift but I enjoy carving faces because I see in the face I see thousands of faces all the time. I, I teach high school. And so even when you see a face, the next day that face changes because they got different expressions. So for me, it's 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 the human expression that I really enjoy. So bringing it out in caricature allows my my funny nature, my humor to come out because then I can I can have somebody squinting or a big chaw tobacco on the side of the face or whatever to bring out that humor. So I've been, like, as I said, I've been carving for several years. I was lucky enough this summer to, my wife and I went down to Utah Valley Wood Carvers Club in Provo, Utah, near Provo. Um, and we, I entered a competition there, won best of division and sold a carving that will be on the cover catalog, the cover of the catalog for Treeline USA. If you know Treeline USA, they're based in, in Provo, Utah, and they sell carving supplies all around the world. So. Uh, every year, Brian Mish, the owner, buys a carving or, or takes photos of a carving and puts it on their on their cover. So I'm I'm honored to to see that happen uh, next year. It'll be their 2022 catalog. So um, I I did a carving of two Civil War soldiers, one one from the north and one from the south, and they look the faces look almost exactly like almost like brothers. And I titled it Family Feud because they're standing. Uh, shoulder to shoulder, so they're 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 one's like one's right shoulder is touching the other's left shoulder as they're as they're in a kind of a at a at an angle. So I was I was pleased to to be able to sell that carving. I kind of wanted to keep it, but uh, you know it's the time to let it go because I can do another one. And and especially honored to be the the cover carving catalog cover of their carving catalog. So. I've been doing that and I've been teaching here in Boise. Uh, I teach at our woodcraft store. And so there's a, always a, there's a class every month for that. In addition to the Boise community, they do night classes for everything from yoga to astrology and everything in between. 
And so I've been teaching with that for several, a uh, couple, two or three years, and just recently picked up a, a homeschool group. And so if, if real quick, funny story, we Woodcraft didn't let anybody under the age of 18 attend any class for any reason. I came along and I said, you know, can we can we look at changing that number? And they dropped it down to 14. And then we did the homeschool kids. And the next thing you know, all these kids that are 14 are really only 12. So one of those things we didn't we didn't check their IDs at the door, but we were trying to figure out how at what what's the lowest age you would let someone do that. So if you're doing a bandsaw, a table saw, you obviously don't for insurance purposes, don't want anybody younger than 18. And that's what their insurance company, insurance underwriter had said, got them to agree to 14 because a knife moves a lot slower and it's usually not uh, as bad an injury as anything else. So we're, we're, we're lucky enough and safe enough to not have any injuries whatsoever other than just a little nick that can be covered up by a bandaid. And so I've, I've been lucky enough to be able to teach a whole lot of people, some of whom have joined carving and some of whom have done it once and decided, no, not for me. I get it. But. Um, I've really enjoyed being being part of that. I, I'm going to grab my script because I'm I'm a little off off my script from what I where where I started. But anyway, uh, when when I talked to Larry about carving uh, and and about coming on and doing a presentation, one of the things was you know what can you pass on to someone who who's never met you? And I'm I, I recognize I see a few names in the in the participants list and 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 there's very few of you that, that I know, and I'm, I'm looking forward to changing that sometime in the future. I, I, I really want to carve a whole lot more in terms of passing that on to others. So what tips, tricks, and techniques can I pass on to you? So at any moment, feel free to raise your hand or pop into the chat or, or uh, give a signal to Larry and, and, and they'll, they'll uh, open it up to, to giving you an opportunity to ask that question. So I'm, I'm, I teach high school. I'm used to kids buttoning in all the time, raising their hands and talking. So that doesn't bother me at all. I'm used to them getting up and going to the bathroom at any moment. So that doesn't bother me at all either. So uh, if at any moment you have a question or, or I didn't explain anything well enough, please, please feel free to, uh, to ask. One of the, one of the big things that I use all the time that's made me successful as a carver and made me successful as a teacher carver is safety. And, and I know some of you are woodworkers, and so it might be a little bit different safety uh, tips when you're when you're doing wood carving. But I can tell you that I rarely ever carve without a carving glove. When I do, generally I, there's a there's a, there's usually a, a day of reckoning after that. And so I I buy carving gloves that are not really expensive, and and mainly for the reason that when you buy an expensive carving glove, it doesn't seem to be they last much longer than the cheap ones. So I'm going to switch cameras and show you what that looks like. I do something a little bit different with my gloves when I'm using them. And so I like using woven gloves just like this. And so this is a woven stretch glove with Kevlar fibers in it. And they make them in, in sizes from extra small. I don't have real big hands, so I use a small size. But these are these are ones that have woven fibers, and so it stretches. It will keep you from slashing, but it won't keep you from poking. And so I I enjoy using these, but I go another step further because I realize it's it's just it's sewn, it's woven. So what I do is I put a cover, a rubber tip cover over that, and then wrap it in vet wrap. And I know there's people that say, don't use vet wrap because it's not very sturdy. Yeah, it works for me. And since I've done this, I, what I do is I have it on my hand. That rubber tip goes on there. It's sewn on and then wrapped in, in the vet wrap, the color stuff. Coban, I guess, is the, is the brand name of that. And so every time I, almost every time I don't have a glove on, I'm almost nicking myself. And so I, I have learned safety number one and so i teach that in my classes and make sure that everyone understands that you you probably shouldn't pick up a knife without having a glove on and you can see i get my money's worth out of these things so i've not cut through the glove well there's a little hole right there but this protects my fingers which are my most precious digits and i've had an accident with a table saw in the past and i lost one and part of another one so the remaining ones i have are very very uh, important to me so basically what i do is i just take the glove and i put that tip over it sew it on and then wrap it in vet wrap and it really protects my fingers from from doing that so 
anytime you're 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 carving you you want to be as safe as you can in addition to that hand i also take those rubber tips and i, I wrap my thumb guard in it those leather ones that you get from carving supply stores they always seem to slide around on me so i use the rubber tip is just these cheap rubber gloves that you get from Harbor Freight or Home Depot, whatever. Cut the fingers off, find one that fits, put it on my thumb, wrap it with vet wrap, and that really protects my thumb. I, ever since I started using these, I've, I've not had anything more than just a bare nick on it. So I, the, my success stems from trying to be as safe as I can, knowing what, what the alternative is. When you, when you don't, you end up with something like this. And so I'm, I'm really particular about how safe I am. One of the other things that I'm really particular about is how we sharpen. When, when you carve, what you want to do is make sure that you're using sharp tools. Anytime you're not, you're having to put more pressure on the tools that you're using. And so when you're carving wood, especially if it's harder wood, the more pressure you have to put on there, the more, more likely it is that, that that's going to rebound somewhere. So as I carve, I'm, I'm making sure that I'm sharpening my tools. And, and the sharpening systems out there are everything from a stick with a piece of leather on it all the way to, you know, thousand dollars worth of worth of, of sharpening things. I have had the, the, the luck of knowing people who knew how to teach me how to do that. And so in, in addition to all the other configurations that we find, here's one of the ones that I found works the best. And I'm, I'm hoping Larry Christ is on here because Larry Christ is the one that makes these. And it is simply a piece of that MDF that we were talking about earlier, a piece of sandpaper for that you would use for sheetrock. So 400, 600, and 800, and then a piece of leather on the other one. And so mine is kind of used up, so you, you knew it might look like this. And it's just simply a flat piece with leather for you to hone your tools and sandpaper that is not very aggressive but it allows you to re-hone and reshape your tools in case you've got a nick in them this is the key thing in addition to other ones that i use this is the key thing this is the, these are the ones that travel with me because when i have these and i'm and i'm and i'm somewhere else where i can't plug a sharpening system in this is this is the perfect system for me it's a little tricky to use with gouges but if you're experienced at doing that you can do that but this is good for really flat blade flat flat blade chisels and knives. And that's one of the things that I stress over and over. I cover that in my classes every time I, no matter where I'm at, I cover how to hone, how, what the difference is between honing and sharpening and how to keep your tools as, as sharp as you can, because the e the sharper it is and the more in tune your tools are, the least likely it is that you're going to get hurt. Because if you're trying to carve and that thing is dull, pushing it through the wood is a, is a dangerous situation. I recently had the opportunity to buy another one. I'll pull this up here and I don't think the camera will back off far enough. But if, I don't know if any of you know Tom Ellis from, from Spokane. Tom manufactures this carving system right here, sharpening system rather. It is made from a two speed massage or a two motor massager. And it has a, a, a backwards and a forward. So you can run one speed and run the other, stop it and then turn it back around the other. And so one has a stone, which has a 600 grit wheel on one side and a 1200 and a 1200 grit on the other one. So 600 and 1200. And then this has an MDF piece of board with leather on it. And this thing only runs at 35 RPM. So there's virtually no chance of you burning a tool and ruining it on this. So I really like this system when I'm traveling and when I don't have to do a lot because at 35 RPMs, it's slow. It's not real fast. And so if you're trying to car, you're trying to hone, everything that you're using that thing can be a, a, a pain to, to use because you'll be you'll be honing and sharpening for a while to get your tools in shape the other big one that i have i have it over here on the corner it's called the it's called the burke system and it's a little more expensive but it's a little more user friendly it has rotating wheels that spin at about 1750 rpms and it allows you to really get that honing back i mean it's it's within a couple minutes and you're done with the tool so I really like that. So, but that's the, the two main things that I stress over and over is sharpening and safety. Another question that comes up a lot when I talk to people, cause I, I, I do with our club, I belong to the Idaho Wood Carvers Guild and we, we carve in public at least once a week. And then sometimes we do demos and we do shows, fairs, things like that. And one of the things that comes up is where do you get your ideas? 
Well, you know, you can get ideas from just about anywhere. I, I'm originally from Tennessee. By, I was born in California and left as a little kid. I grew up in Tennessee. My dad was from Alabama. He married a woman from Tennessee. We moved back there. Southerners have a unique way of looking at the world. And I, I wish we all looked at that way because everything's funny. I don't care what you're looking at. I don't care what you're doing. Everything is humorous in some way. It doesn't matter whether it's toilet humor or highbrow humor. Everything's funny. And so every time I look at something, I see a way to turn that into funny. It, it, it drives my wife nuts because I think of things that, in ways that she doesn't. And, and she does the same thing. She thinks of things that I don't. But I like I like to look at things and 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 find the humor in it. I, I've got an idea for a carving that I probably will never do. So any of you out there that are caricature carvers, feel free to do that. But I have an idea of a cow standing in a field, looking at the front end of a, you know you know those old Cadillacs, old '60s '70s Cadillacs with the horns on the hood. I have an idea for a cow standing there looking at that and saying, "Uncle Bob." I, I just find the humor in that kind of stuff, and and to me being a caricature carver caricature carving is is at its at its at its purest is just an exaggeration you know you see a caricature carving where if you go to the fair and you get your caricature picture done your head's like this big and your body's like this big because they're emphasizing and over exaggerating the head or the face or whatever facial features you have you know you know the jay leno with the really pointed chin that's what you would carve in, in terms of, of that feature for that person. So for me, I just, I enjoy seeing the humor. I have a, a little book that I keep every time we write, every time I hear about or, or think about something or, or, or think of, or come up with an idea, my wife and I would look at each other and say, write that down. It's from an old movie uh, with uh, Brendan Fraser in it where his wife, his mother sending him long story. Anyway, she says, write that down. Everything she wanted him to do, write that down. So I've gotten, I've got a book full of ideas. I'll never carve all of them. I'll be glad to give away a few to some people who might want to carve caricatures. But at, at its best, caricature is just exaggeration. And so if you can exaggerate it in a humorous way rather than an insulting way, to me, that is where I, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to do. I want to do that kind of carving. And so I always look at caricature carving as how can I find the humor that anyone else would? Because it doesn't matter if I find it. If no one else finds it funny, then I can't teach a class on it. I can't sell it. And I, it's basically going to have to be given away or it's one of my permanent collections. So I see a couple of uh, uh, comments in the chat. I'll wait if anybody has anything they want to say or ask. I'll give me a chance to wet my whistle. Yeah, the, uh, the, the chats are just chit chat. Unless I'm missing something. Uh, so I don't see any any real questions out there. I just saw the bubble that said two there, so I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. What's the name of that uh, 35 RPM sharpener again? It's Tom. So Tom Ellis is the one who made it. And, and I, I think he sells them only on eBay. And it's T-O-M-Z. It's called the Tom's Knife Massager. In fact, one of the guys in our club just recently bought one and was really pleased to get it. He, I think he had to get a hold of Tom himself. But Tom Ellis from Spokane, he's part of the Spokane Wood Carvers group up there. And it, he calls it the Tom's Knife Massager. And so everybody that I know that bought one got the got the massager. And then that, that sticker you saw that said, have you hugged a wood carver today? Tom sends one of those. And then there is he if he has them he generally sends you a detail knife to go with it that he makes himself so i've, I've okay. used i've used some of his tools and they're pretty good okay and just to plug the uh, our club does own a uh a, the smaller baby burke sharpening system chuck reinhardt grew up on that and that's one of the two power systems that we have but roger crooks is putting together really a, quite a comprehensive beginning sharpening uh, program focused in on stropping Yep. And it's uh, buying good, emphasizing buying good tools. And uh, there's a plug for there's an interest list on the uh, on our website. If you're interested in being part of that, want to learn more about it, put your name on that interest list because we are going to look for guinea pigs pretty soon and real people pretty soon. I'm going to turn my camera so you can see. That. Sure. I do have one question. Where, what kind of gloves are you using, and where do you get them? I I get these gloves that I'm using 
these ones right here off of eBay and I, and I buy them they're they're ambidextrous so they fit either hand and I've, I've just recently seen some where they have a covering on one but that means now once you put that covering on the palm of that glove it can't go on the other hand I buy these and I think I generally get them for about six or eight dollars per pair and a good a, if I'm if I'm careful a glove will last me several months Thanks, I don't I don't I, I don't Eric, know the brand name. I just type in safety carving safety glove. Sorry, Larry, go ahead. You know, after the program, Eric, why don't you, if you can, send me any any links or anything you can. I put out a post program uh, reminder once the gotcha. uh, recording is up, and I'll I'll pass that on. Will do. I'm pointing Thank at you. my my Burt sharpener. It has one, two, three wheels on it. These two have sandpaper of. 180 and 320 and this one has leather on it this thing runs at 1750 rpms and the bars here that you see if you don't have a burke these bars right here that you see here have holes that you can mount an additional rod down here put a double pulley on the motor and that that rod down here could be for contoured sharpening honing for gouges and v tools and things like that so this is I, a friend of mine actually gave this to me, so I, I know they're about three hundred and fifty dollars or more when you buy the whole the whole set, which you can buy on several sites. This one, I I don't know if it's an original John Burke or if it was made um, by someone else, but that's the one that I use when I really want to want to turn and and sharpen real fast. So that that's the that's the the key thing is sharpening and and safety. When I when I carve, and, and, and I, I'm like most carvers, for a long time you, you do somebody else's stuff because, you know, that's what you do. You're learning. And so a, a carver comes along, you learn to carve that way they do. You get another one, and pretty soon you have a pretty good set of skills in carving. And I did the same thing for a long time. I carved everybody else's stuff. I went to classes and I carved the way they wanted to, although I, I've always kind of changed my own way. One of the things that I do, I'm now getting into drawing my stuff. I, I've, I've been lucky enough to have two articles in Car Wood Carving Illustrated, and I have another one coming out next fall. My first article was in, let me turn the camera. My first article was in summer of 2018, issue 83. I'm not sure if you can see that very well. And this was my first wood carving project that they printed, and it was carving a relief caricature. And so this was a hiker. And when I sent it to them, they changed it uh, or added to it by making a firefighter, a, a soldier, and a hunter. All, all of these, each of these three, four projects can be done from that one blank. And I and I've taught this I've taught this class several times and, and I, I usually offer it when I travel as well. But this this was my first one. My second one was in fall of 2019, issue 88. And this is the one that I made called a fan bear. So you make a fan bear where he's holding, and you can't see that very well. He's got the finger, the foam finger where he's holding it up. So infinitely customizable. You can put your favorite team on there. But this one was what they call a carving. Uh, they, they make two articles. They make a pattern article where it's just the pattern and the, and the picture in a couple of steps. And then they make a carving article. And so that's what this one was. I have another one coming out in the fall. It'll be a, a, a fall-oriented project with a, 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 mummy and a, mummy, a mummy about the size of a small child and a, and a dog trying to play fetch and catch with the with the with the child so i've been extremely lucky to do that uh and 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 be able to help others who want to learn how to carve with just simple projects i have a youtube channel as well where i where i teach so if anybody's interested in that i can talk a little bit about that later but what what when i carve now that i'm into into designing my own projects i'm i'm having to become better at drawing and, you know, I'm like everybody else. I've taken art classes when we were in high school, and maybe you tried drawing a little bit after that. And at some point, you kind of put the pencil aside and you quit drawing, and I'm not sure why. But anyway, I'm, I'm having to get back into drawing. So now I'm learning how to draw my own patterns. Part of that is having the right tools. And one of them that I use 
is this is this thing here i'll switch the camera again this little body display thing here is really helpful because they make all kinds of uh, accessories for this you can have him holding the gun you can bend and twist and turn it's on the small side as you can see it's only about four inches five inches tall but it's very useful for doing this but this is rather expensive my son bought it for me as a gift for christmas um, and i think at the time it was somewhere around 60 or 80 bucks for this so it's not for everybody and so what you need to do is find the ways in which you can make your own and so i have this one is made out of pipe cleaner and so it has magnets on the bottom so you can stand it up on something but these are plastic things with pipe cleaner and the, the torso and the pelvis area and the arms and the head you can really get a lot of use out of this a lot of traction out of making it you know shaping the different sizes moving whatever but that's kind of it's kind of small and it's kind of not what you're looking for so a friend of mine told me about something called a Bojangles. And a Bojangles is simply a series of wooden pieces, arm, upper arm, torso, pelvis, upper leg, bottom leg, and foot. And so these pieces are cut out of real thin plywood, real thin slat wood, and put together with these Rapid rivets is what it's called. Got it from Tandy Leather. Not very expensive. I think the cost is about I don't know, eight or ten bucks, something like that. But these rivets will hold the pieces together. The good thing about this is you can have this in a lot of different configurations. So you can draw one side. So this is one leg coming forward, and then you draw around it, and then you have the other leg coming back. And by the time you draw that on a piece of paper, you have a running man. Or it's a cowboy sitting on a fence. So sitting on the fence back here, got his legs on the fence, got his feet out there. These are really useful for a lot of things. Bend the arm, twist, you know, turn the arm, whatever. And then when, once you put the hat, the head up here, I'm not sure if I've got the head in this bag. I do not. But once you put the head up here, you've got a cowboy, you've got a farmer, you've got whatever you want. So this helped me when I was starting out before I learned how to carve because I could do the side profile. And if you're carving out of a block of wood, you really, if I laid this right on the block of wood, I can draw on that or draw my pattern. And then really from there, I don't really need a front or back pattern as long as I've got two sides, if you, if you can see the, the 3D in here. So for me, that's been, a godsend for being able to draw and figure out my own my own pieces. And so I'll send um, if you'd like, Larry. I'll send you a, a, a picture of these. I don't have a I don't have a um, I don't have a PDF of them, but I can take a picture or make one. And basically, you you construct it from all these different little pieces that you that you put together. So there's the head right there. So if you wanted to do the head like that, you could. But anyway, you, you break each every one of these pieces up into individual lower leg. Sorry, I'm getting so lower leg and upper leg. Once you put those together, you know what you know what you're doing, what, what part you're doing. The boot goes on the bottom. There's the there's the hip. There's the whatever. So you can you can do a lot a lot with this particular way of of drawing. So if you want to draw and you're interested in and in, in, in not always doing somebody else's rough out or blank, then this would be one way to get into that and, and start designing your own, your own patterns. So for me, I, that's the joy of it. I don't, I don't know that everybody sees humor the same way that I do. So being able to draw my own allows me to get that, whatever I see there out of that. So whether I'm just doing a carving of Mark Twain or a dog, I can I can do the humorous part of it by by simply using using what I have. One of the other things that I use as well is a light box. So a light box where the you turn it on, the light comes up from underneath. I can put that on there and I can trace over it and I can draw. I can while it's on the light box, I can manipulate the legs, shoot it and size it down. I can do a number of different things when I'm when I'm carving that way. And so just a little bit of the 
ideas of how I do caricatures. Pinterest has really been a godsend for those people who don't draw very well and want to do their own stuff because you can find patterns on Pinterest. One of the things I've noticed recently is if you have the right keywords you poke in, you can find things. I found out that one of the keywords was called turnaround, T-U-R-N-A-R-O-U-N-D. If I put in there caricature pose turnaround, what it'll do, it'll show me the front, the side, the back, and the other side. It shows that figure turn in four different ways. And so for those of you that have a hard time, you do the two, you do the front and back, or you do the two sides, how do you do the rest of it if you're not used to drawing? And that's one of the ways to do that. Caricature, po caricature poses or char character poses or tur uh, po character turnaround, it'll show you a lot of different ones from male and female and whatever in all, diff all four views. And I know when, when you pick up a carving magazine, it'll show you what the four views of that carving is. And it allows you to be able to go from your idea to whatever you want right into right into putting it on that piece of wood and carving it from there so so i, I talk about how i do caricature carving I'll, I'll pause for a second i'll wet my whistle again somebody got a question there or a chat uh, jason put on in the chat he put on a link for a um uh, one of the Tom's devices for sale. And then uh, Dave Wilcox said he bought the same gloves on Amazon and Home Depot. Gotcha, cool. So I don't know how how, verse, uh, how well versed you are in, in caricature carving. I, 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 and I've tried a lot of different carving. I tried chip carving and then decided it wasn't for me. And I, I've tried a few bird carvings and, and we have a running joke in our club about the bird carving as the dark side because to me, it looks like sorcery and magic, and all of a sudden, they've done a wonderful job, and I, I don't know how to do that. I, I'm not that patient. I'm not that skilled. I'm not that good at it, so I stick with the caricature because nobody can tell me that ear's too big. I made it bigger, but that's the way it is. If you've never seen caricature carving, let me show you a few examples, if you'll, if you'll bear with me a minute or two. Well, caricature carving is essentially just taking... Um, some kind of, 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 of looking for a better example, some kind of character and turning it into a, a different scene. So here's one. I've got, I did this in a class in North Carolina at the John C. Campbell School. It's an old school marm, you know, she just looks like she's heading to school. And look at that face. That is, that's the lady in, in, in third grade English class you didn't want to cross because she would, blister you with words without really you know telling you but I, the caricature is just simply taking a few of the features her long hook nose her droopy jowls and turning her into an old lady and so for me when i do caricature carving i do what i call flat plane so i'll, I'll introduce that for those of you that don't know what flat plane carving is she she has she has a partner as well. Here's the, the male version of the school marm. And so both of them just tall, skinny, carrying their books in their arms. And, and so I use, I use what I call a modified flat plane. So the idea behind flat plane carving, if, you, if you've never heard of it, is the, is the idea that everything can be broken down into a series of planes. And an arm is basically an, an octagon. You've got a flat surface here, you've got two sides, and then you've got the back, and then you've got the other sides on the other as well. Flat plane carving, I was told, came from Scandinavia. In 1700s, the, the king controlled a lot of the guilds and a lot of the skilled working that went on. And so being able to buy a tool was out of the out of the purchase of, of most of the peasants so in order to make a little money they wanted to make things and so rather than making something out of straw or something out of sticks or whatever they found they learned that they could have a knife because everybody needs a knife for cutting open things and trimming branches and whatever the the peasants could have a knife without having to join the artist guild because everybody needed a knife anything beyond that any kind of gouge or any kind of shape tool that adds or anything like that they needed to join the guild and buy it from the guild. 
the story I was told was that that allowed the king of whatever the province was to control the guilds and allow the guilds to not become too powerful. I, I, I don't know whether that's true, but it sounds good to me. So they learned how to carve with just one knife. And so one knife lends itself to these long planes. So a big, long blade, three or four inch blade, and you're carving these long planes. You end up with getting with some of these European carvings that look somewhat like this. Let me switch cameras again. And so here's one of a priest. A, a, holding a Bible and you see the long planes there, the long flat planes, very few details, but it still conveys the impression of a guy standing there, ample girth to him. And those faces are simple as well. Again, there's not a lot of details added to these flat plane carvings. And so I've got a, I've got a bucket of those and short of, Short of, of boring you to death with them, I want to show you a few that really stand out to me. Here's one I really enjoy. This guy, the book bookmarm, carrying his books. And so if you'll see the flat plane part of it, you see a lot of just, not a lot of detail, not a lot of facets. I mean, that one leg has one long curving cut up the side the back of the leg, the back of the jacket. Not a lot of detail added to these kinds of things. And so I think, I can't tell, I don't think the books were carved in place. I think they were inserted and certainly the bird was at the top. But this is the kind of carving that I gravitate to. And so the flat plane allowed me to carve quicker and when you're when you're young and new and learning how to do carving, you don't want to spend days and days and days learning a technique. You want to learn it, get in and get after it and get it done. And so these the Scandinavians who are carving and trying to make a little bit of extra money, especially during the winter time, they made these real quick. And so they were done with a big knife and they were done with big cuts. And they could do one of these in about 15 minutes. And by the time you slap some paint on it, you've got a half an hour. And so everything from the ear to the beard to the sweater was made with big fat cuts. And so once you're practiced at these and you can do them in a little bit of nothing. And so that allowed them to be able to take whatever they were carving and turn it out fairly quickly. And so eventually the size grew and they got bigger and bigger. But And you added maybe a little few more details, but it's still there's not a lot of not a lot of wrinkles, not a lot of facets added to these things in terms of, of, a, of a style of carving. And so it lends itself to carving fast if you're a production carver and you want to make, you know, you're selling it to make money. But it gives you an opportunity to, again, put some of that humor. Here's the man. Here's his wife. So sold in a set, you, you can imagine this might bring in a little bit of money for the peasant who's carving using his knife rather than having to worry about running down the guild, join the guild, and paying money. Not that that's a bad thing because we're all part of a guild, but at the time there wasn't a whole lot of spare money for most of those peasants, most of those farm workers to be able to do that and make money. So by the time they paid the guild joining fee and the monthly uh, fee or whatever was that was, it was it was difficult for them to justify spending that kind of money on this kind of venture. So, so I got into I got into doing the the, the flat plane carving, and so I use what I call a modified. So I don't use the flat plane on everything, but I use it on enough of the carving to give the impression of flat plane. And then I'll add a few more wrinkles than normal. I'll add a few more like on a dog. I'll add the toes, whereas some of the flat plane carvers would not add any details. They would just have the carving and there it was. And so that for me is where I've been going for quite some time. I've been holding the caricature true because I want to exaggerate something. And then I've been holding the flat plane fairly well in the meantime as well. And so for me, that's been a, a, a great opportunity to turn out some of these 
projects that I have because I realize I don't care if I live to be 100, I'm probably not going to carve everything in that in that idea book because I seem to come up with ideas every once in a while and I just fill them in and then it leads to two or three more and it's kind of like a fountain. All of a sudden you've got 15 ideas. You can't write them down fast enough and then you go dry for a while. And so I've got pages and pages and drawings that I've done on carvings that I want to do. One of the one of the latest one of the earliest projects that I did some time ago I'll sh I'll show you and I'll I'll play around with carving that I don't want to bore you to death for the next three hours carving but I found a a I found a carving that I really got a kick out of so I picked it up because I think it was only about three or four dollars and so maybe you can tell what that is I'll bring it a little closer but it's just I think it's a donkey just kind of you know sitting on his haunches and i like i like the idea of it being flat plane because there's not a lot of details and not a lot of not a lot of carving on this i mean after you've done two or three of these things i would imagine you could probably you know bang them out for the tourist trade in just a few minutes so then i took that same idea and went to let's see if we can i don't i don't know much about donkeys anytime i've been around donkeys or mules they kind of have a tendency to take their anger out on you. So I thought, what if we turn this into a dog? What if we take that flat plane idea and turn it into a dog? And so I got the idea to do a dog. Not a lot of details on this guy. Long floppy ears that you could customize. You could certainly make them shorter, rounder, whatever. Long pointed tail, long legs big facets cut out from every part of the of the of the carving so i really like this and i did i did a i did a couple of these i have one i haven't haven't completely finished painting i did the carving left it in the in the raw carved state so that you could see what it was but that is a simple dog with feet a tail two ears and then the face you could have him howling or not howling. And so just a real simple carving that one could do with a knife if you were a peasant from Scandinavia and you wanted to carve one of those. So let me play around with this and I'll, that'll give you an opportunity for somebody to make some, ask some questions or make some comments. I know, I know our, carving club when we carve we love chatting with each other and so getting giving you an opportunity is reaching for a pencil giving you an opportunity to ask questions if you if you've got any questions i'm going to draw a few details on here there's the back there's the there's the ear back of the head eye socket nose coming up here mouth let me draw that with a marker my wife says you can't see that so i better draw with a marker there's the back haunches there's the ears coming down there's the face and head and the snout bottom of the mouth relatively simple there's not a whole lot to this carving you're going to shape the tail you're going to shape the head you're going to round the parts of the body so that it stands out but essentially this is the exact same thing here there's not we're not going to take off a whole lot of wood here and pretty soon you've got it you've got a, a, a carving that somebody sitting somewhere would really enjoy watching you do or wanting to buy from you or you know in most cases they want to want you to give it to them so not necessarily what you want to do if you spend hours and hours on this but you know I get I get a lot of requests for donations for the auctions and things like that. And so we uh, in our carving club, what we have done is come up with several projects, several simple projects that we can do while we're sitting somewhere. And a lot of times we give them to kids. And so kids will love having a carving. We have a basket that has owls and a number of other things in it when somebody wants to give something we just throw it in the basket and then when we go somewhere we have them laying there and a the kid comes by maybe you'll get them inspired by watching watching uh seeing a carving being done so i'm going to take my knife out here and make a few wax on this thing 
when we talk about flat plane carving, generally you want a knife that's about two inches long because that enhances the ability to make long cuts. And so when I cut across this, the longer the blade, it gives me an opportunity to cut right in and make cuts that way. Smaller the blade, nothing wrong with that. It just means you're going to have to work harder at it. And so I would just simply make some cuts. I'm just rounding the, the bottom of the body out a little bit on both sides. And I've got some facets already cut in there that I would want to take out those bandsaw marks. So there's a bandsaw mark right here and a bandsaw mark right here and another little nick that I got in there and another one here. So by the time you're done, you want to take all of those out. You don't want any of those bandsaw marks left behind for somebody to, to wonder why you didn't clean that up. Any questions Larry, so Larry. far? I'm sorry, Larry, go ahead. I was just going to ask, when you, teach a, when you teach a woodcraft, are you teaching flat plane? Are you teaching caricatures? What, what kind of things are being taught at woodcraft or in the so community I, ed program that you have? I, well, I started teaching just beginner classes. And uh, the, the guy that taught before me was teaching both intermediate and advanced carving. And he retired from carving for back problems, and I took his spot there. And so when, in talking to the, to the store owner, all he wanted to do was was beginner. And I get it. I mean, it, it was probably a lot of um, marketing in there. If you could have a beginner class and then you could sell them tools. Uh, if you had an intermediate class, most of those folks show up without tools or show up with their own tools. And so most we, we tried an intermediate class and then COVID hit. So, you know, not very many things have survived COVID. So. Um, what I'm teaching primarily is beginner, and what I'm teaching primarily with beginner is relief carving. So let me grab let me grab an example of that here. I got one laying here. My relief carving project for this month, and relief being one side only, because these are beginners and most of them have never held a knife. My relief my relief carving project for this month is. Uh, a little old old truck and a, hauling a Christmas tree. Nothing on the back because it's a three hour class. And if somebody shows up and is never carved, uh, getting them to get this much done in three hours is really difficult. And especially when we, when we sit down and look at the data, the data tells us this, most people don't sign up for another class. They take the class and then they go home. And if they want to practice, they practice. And if they don't, they give up carving. In the community ed, they're, it's an experiential class. They're coming for the experience. And so by the end of it, they most likely, most people indicate that they want a finished project. So making a relief carving, regard, regardless of how detailed it is, making one of these relief little trucks is about as simple as what we can put together for a three hour class. And in that, if they have any experience holding a knife, like peeling an apple or whatever, I bring paint, I bring finishing, I bring everything they need to do that. And whether they want to turn this into an ornament, which they could do by putting an eye, an eye one of those things, eye, it's got an eye on it, eye hook. And then we put um, some, kind of, some kind of string in there for hanging on the tree. And by the time they painted it and put that in, they put in three, two and a half, close to three hours to get finished. And then it's, it's sealed and we let it sit for a long, long enough for it to soak in there. But we're, I'm not doing any flat plane primarily because what they want is a finished project. And flat plane is hard to get people to understand because you and I may sit here and take big cuts out of this thing to make it really stand out. They're going to sit here and go, you know, in 20 minutes, they may have 12 shavings. Uh, so they're looking for the experience and because most of them have never carved, you have to teach them safety. You have to teach them the, the basic cuts. You have to teach them how to hold the knife and when, you have to teach them how to read the grain. And so the first half hour of the class is talked about the mechanics, how and the particulars of how to carve and what you're looking for. So I'm not doing very much flat plane carving in that class simply because uh, they need to learn how to hold the knife for the most part. My homeschool class is the same way. Now, though most of those kids have been coming over for um, six to eight months by now. And so they're they're very experienced at holding their knife, but they're kids. And so they have about three minutes of carving and 10 minutes of talking about the latest Dungeons and Dragons campaign they're on. 
and then they get back to carving for five minutes and then they talk about the TV show they just watched. So, you know, it's like 14 year olds, they have the attention span of about 10 minutes. So teaching them flat plane carving is, is, is not what we're looking for. They're, they're looking, in fact, the mothers were complaining that the simplest projects that I was bringing, it was a much smaller version of this dog was one of them that we did. They, the, the kids were like, I'm here for the experience. That's, that's the indication they give you. Moms wanted them to finish. They wanted a finished project that they could put on the, on the wall or on the refrigerator. So I designed a few, we glue a magnet on, you put it on the refrigerator, there you go. So not, not, these are the, I know, I know the kids that are coming in because there's six or seven of them that come every time, but the community ed is just people signing up for experience. I, I never know who these people are. Same thing with woodcraft. I might know one or two out of the 10, but I don't know many of them. And so I'm just, I'm trying to give them an experience that they enjoy showing them the tools, showing them how inexpensive it is to get into carving. And then hopefully they continue. And some do there's, 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 a good proportion of them that don't as well. So I'm not teaching any any kind of flat plane carving, but then when I do a class for our club, which we have a class, uh, we try to have a class every month, um, we, I, I'll inject a little bit of flat plane in there because for me, that's one of the quickest ways to get form and function out of a carving. If you want a sleeve and you only have to make three cuts, one across the top, one across the front, and one across the bottom, that's a lot easier for most people to understand than it is where you got to, okay, let's add detail and so let's add, let's add wrinkles and let's add patterns and things like that. So, so then Eric, being able to get to a finished product really better for them. Eric, let me just uh, ask you to pause just for a minute. I'd like a stimulated discussion. I'm going to see if I can put a few people on the spot without calling names like Michael Burjo or any of the Capital Woodcarvers or any of the Salem or any of the Jerry Boone's. The question is about flat plane carving. You know, what is your, what do you do personally when someone shows up in Milwaukee as a newcomer, at the Milwaukee Center, or what do you do in uh, Jerry when you have people in your your weekly programs um, in Mesa? Because is flat plane carving a part of that or not a part of that? I'm gonna un, I'm going to unspotlight uh, Eric so we can maybe look at the uh, the broad thing and see if anybody would like to pipe up on the general topic of uh, flat plane carving. The Roman, Roman too, well, Santa Clara. Who wants to go first, Michael? Thank you, Larry. Uh, well, you know, I first of all, I try and emphasize to everybody, no matter if they've never done a thing, what do you want to do and have them do something that they have some interest in and not give them something that they, that's my own, putting my own feelings into it. But when I started, I didn't want to go through a whole bunch of practice exercises that had not, that were of a different genre than what I was interested in doing. So I try and establish what they want, but we, we certainly give them something simple to get started with in a type that they might value. Uh, Along those lines, with the uh, uh, the Columbia Flyway show, now we've had for the last well, we of course haven't had a show for two years, but previous to that, for a couple of years, we had uh, new antique style decoy, and that's something that can be taught and executed and taken home in about two class sessions. Uh, so after we did that, now we've added uh, a youth division kind of springboarding off of that where they can with a cutout off of a bandsaw they can rough it out paint it finish it in just you know a short period of time just like what eric's talking about people do uh, want to have some feeling of completion and not sit down to something that they have to take weeks to work on yeah but is, is anybody doing flat plane carving in the group that you have at milwaukee uh, several of us have books, have Refsel and others, you know, and, and have played with it. We have a couple of caricature carvers that I would still say aren't really doing flat planes specifically. Uh, I have an interest in it, but 
I have an interest in so many things that it's hard, like like Eric was saying, hard to find the time to get around to all of them. Uh, yeah. That's partly why I signed up for the relief class to force myself to do some relief and squeeze it in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So not to not to put Roman on not to put Roman on the spot or to put Larry Wanamaker on the spot. These are two different two different clubs. Are you do, do you have people doing flat plane carving in your areas, Roman? Uh, I'm not sure uh, about flat carving, but I enjoy doing chip carving. And chip carving is very similar to flat plane carving. Uh, here is an example of that. That is my strop. And about uh, flat plane carving, I bought that in Goodwill. Just go there, see what kind of projects are there, and you can see it, flat plane carving. Uh, another comment, uh, yeah, several hundred years ago when guilds were available, it was illegal, uh, as was being said, it was illegal for peasants to have any kind of tools except a knife and the axe. So only those two tools were allowed. And that's what people needed to use. Yeah. And that's, I think, it's all that, that I have uh, okay. to say today. Hey, thanks, Roman. Anybody else have a comment on flat plane? Otherwise, we'll switch back to Eric. Well, I'll add in something, you know, about Eric's characters that uh, immediately reminded me of Dave Dieselbrett because he had his person and, uh, you know, he would do it 101 different ways. And we talked at some length about that and how once you got it down, then whether it's a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief, it didn't really matter. Uh, and that's the great thing about putting some effort into a style that takes you there where it's a man or it's a woman it, it, they're all so similar that you know it, it's good to, good production like Eric was saying you can make them fairly fast okay thanks for mentioning Thank thanks for mentioning Dave Disselbred I really miss that guy I he was one of one of the first classes I took from carving up at uh, Tri-Cities and I really really enjoyed learning from him I did I've done several of his projects yeah I miss him too Okay, I wanted Eric, I, you go ahead. You're back. You're, you're back on spotlight now, Eric. So you, you gotcha. got the microphone. Okay. I want to do, I've seen, a, I've seen several of his projects and I wonder, I, one of my good friends is, is uh, Everett Koontz down at, down at Salem. I wonder if, if Dave would think odd if I taught some of his classes, if I decide, you know, taught the classes, this is Dave Disselbrett's project and we're going to pass that on with him. But, uh, I don't know. I'll talk with I'll talk about that with Everett when I get back because ever he and Everett were really close. So, but I've I've seen I've seen some of his projects and I'd hate for them to just disappear in the dustbin. I'd like to see, you know, somebody be introduced to some of the stuff that he did because a lot Eric, of his stuff was was flat plane. Eric, there's a question from from Dave Wilcox about can we see one of your antique carvings you're talking about? So yeah, let me pull out a couple. I have a whole bucket of them because I'm like I'm like the, your your friend there a minute ago that mentioned buying them at Goodwill. I, I I buy a lot of them. I find them for three or four dollars at a at an estate sale, and some of them I'm I'm surprised at the price because they don't there's not there's not a whole lot of price to them. So here's here's probably the oldest one that I have, and this thing looks pretty beat up, but it's the typical Scandinavian because the carving was about everyday life and here's a kid coming home with today's today's dinner and this thing it has has no signature on it so you don't know who it is although it's in the henning style from norway but this is you know because this face here is the same face as you see from the henning norway female and the henning norway male face so there's not a whole lot of difference between these two faces because they're basically from the same type of genre. These are the flat plane. See the big long facets right here. These are the flat plane, although this one has a lot more detail 
than this one. These are some of these are some of the things that you find that are just they're treasures when you find them because you know somebody put some effort into it. Somebody did a lot of good work. Again, another another henning kid carrying a fish. Another henning sea captain that a lot of a lot of the Scandinavians seem to be sticking to one type of one type of um, character that you see. Another one of a of a, a priest. He's got his violin, but he's he's you know pausing for a moment to eat something, eat a piece of bread or something. Again, just these long, flat plane facets. Um, one of the first ones I ever bought was this one was German. It was a German one. Still, a lot of flat plane in there. But look at the detail on this face as opposed to some of those others. And, and you know, you don't need a whole hole here for a, a jacket and a, and a button. It's just the indication. Uh, let's see. One that's a little more detailed. I have a, I have a pair. I'm going to have to move a few things out of the way. I have a pair of these two. This is a little, I think this is um, Leo Maroder from uh, Switzerland. This is um, Italy, sorry. This is made in Italy on the bottom. And you see the face where this little girl has dropped a plate which is broken. So she's got that oh no look to her face. Still big facet cuts, but and and highly sanded on some parts of it. But they've uh, they've added a lot of detail in other places, less detail than you would normally see in a flat plane carving. Here's the companion to it, the little boy companion to her. I'm always fascinated with these carvings that have all kinds of things attached to them that are carved as one piece. All of this is one piece of wood. You can see it's attached down there at the bottom of the leg. One I found just the other day, and I was really intrigued by it because it has no signature on the bottom, although there's a sticker gone. I don't know what it was. But this was really, really well done. It's a lady with her book in her hand standing at the helm of the, I don't know, maybe that's the, it looks like a wagon wheel, but it, I guess you could also argue it's a, it's a ship wheel but you know flat plane big curves don't need a whole lot of whole lot of carving in there for the for the cloak that she has on or for the headdress that she has but i you know i, I i'm amazed that i only i think i only paid 12 dollars for this thing and it's it's got to be nine inches ten inches tall side the point Where? doesn't matter but you yeah. find these so things Eric, just about Eric, where you go. Go back, yeah. go back and, and, and redefine what you mean by modified flat plane carving as you practice it. So as I practice it, modified or flat plane carving would be flat plane here, flat plane here, flat plane everywhere in between, and just a few details added to it. So the face is even flat plane. It's got a big cut here for the eyes, a big cut here for the cheek, big for the mouth, cut in a little bit there. So for me, my flat plane uh, uh, modification is going to be adding more details. So you don't see, I mean, you see a couple of cuts in there for wrinkles. Mine would have maybe two more wrinkles in there and it wouldn't have just one here. I would round it a little bit more. So my modification comes from wanting to add more detail without really having to add more detail. I'm just going to add a few more um, wrinkles, a few more rounds in the cuff, things like that, as opposed to one long one long piece one long one long facet i'm going to add a few more here and then right in here add some wrinkles maybe some detail around the knees and detail at the back of the knees so i'm going to use this as a as a as a stepping point because because i took a class from harley refsaw some of you may know him and and that was the question is flat plane a process or a or a, a product in other words is the goal for it to look like flat plane when you're done or is the goal to use flat plane to get flat plane so in other words if this looks like one long cut but it took me four cuts to get there and then i came at the end of it and made one long cut down it because i used the little cuts to shape it and then i cut down to give the final facet what's more important and he says yes <laughs> basically the, the the process is 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 important because if you're carving quickly you want big cuts 
but the product is what you're looking for uh, ultimately. And so hey, let, me, the, let, me, let, me, let me drive down one more point, then I'll let you keep going. But you had a gouge out when you were carving the dogs on the break. You had a, it looked like a small gouge. And it looks like some of the pieces you displayed have some gouge marks instead of just knife marks. Is that, is that a progression? I mean, is, it, is, is flat plane carving constrained to a knife? Well, historically, yes. Modern, modern times, no. I think flat plane is what you want to get out of it. So if you want it to be flat plane look, then that comes out with a gouge and it comes out with it or a knife and a big gouge. And so I, I, I teach in my classes because a lot of people have never carved before. They're carving this way. And by, by the time an hour and a half has gone and they're gripping this tool, they find out their hands are giving out because they're not used to it. So I always teach them to switch to a gouge, which is the same thing. It's just the gouge is cutting along this sharp edge. The knife is cutting along that sharp edge. But you can now hold that and use your shoulder instead of just your hand. So I teach it as a, as a, as a product and a process at the same time. To get there, you got to take a lot of wood off. And whether you take it off with one cut or 12, the process at the end to look flat plane is, is, is what you're looking for. So while this guy may have one flat here and one flat there and one flat here, if you're adding more details, they may have more wrinkles here. You may have a couple more here. You may have a couple back here at the back of the, at the, back of the, the arm as well. So I teach it as, as a product and a process. This is what we want to get there. How you get there is up to you. Do you need to do it with 12 cuts? Do you need to do it with two? Does that answer your question, Larry? Sorry, I don't. Yeah, it does. And I guess the ultra underlying question, some of us, this club, the group here, the origin came in through the Guild of Oregon Woodworkers. So a lot of classical carving, uh, decorative kind of carving. I'm pretty sure that the capital carvers have a lot of caricature carvers and historically there have been a lot of caricature carvers around here. So the kind of the underlying question is how do you get started caricature carving? It would, would you start with the with, uh, flat plane or would you there's some other mechanism to, to, to get started? I don't I don't think we start anybody off on flat plane because when I started going to this club when I first joined it the, the idea was anytime somebody comes in new, we always start them on the same project and it always ended up being a boot. Well, and, and you, and you just don't know because somebody walking in brand new, you don't know what they're looking for. Are they coming in looking for a hobby social club? Are they coming in looking for another skill? Are they coming in just looking for a fun evening to get away from the house? I don't know. And so start them all off on a boot. And when you go from there, we'll start off on another project. And so over the course of the years, I've slowly built up a bucket of beginner projects that when someone shows up, I have knives, I have a, a 10 sets of beginner of uh, tools for them to use that we loan out to them for the night. And so let's sit down and carve. If you want to carve a feather, if you want to carve a boot, you want to carve a dog, snowman, whatever that is, let's get you started. Because the idea is to get them in and hook them, a term we use in school. You got to hook them before you can, before they're interested. And then see where they want to go. So the idea was let's start everybody off on the same way. Everybody carves a boot. Whether you want to carve a boot or not, it's immaterial. We'll start you off on a boot because from that we can teach you the, the four main cuts, how to hold your knife, how to be safe, how to wear a glove, all that, how to sharpen your tool. So the idea wasn't we're going to start you off on flat plane. You may not even like flat plane, but we're going to start you on the same set of projects that we've all done in our beginning days and, and build up from there. And so we're not we're not saying come in here and we'll show you how to do this. It's hey sit down and and by the way here's a project uh, if you want to start. If you don't want that, dig through the bucket and see if you can find something in there that you like. Because I've got you know, I don't know probably a dozen or so different projects in that bucket of, of blanks that we've used over the years. And a lot of them were taken right out of Wood Carving Illustrated or Chip Chats or the old carving magazine. They were ones that we start everybody off on to see where they want to go. Because if they realize, oh, my arthritis is kicking up, I can't carve, then it doesn't matter whether they're doing a bird, a bird or a boot, they're not going to stick with it. So get them started on something, see how they handle it. If they, can, if they like it and want to come back, we'll start them off on something else. And then by the time they've got two projects done, then we can start that conversation of really where do you want to go? How do you want to get there? Do you want to do a big bird? Will you start by doing little birds? Do you want to you want to do this? You know, how do you get there? Okay. Eric, uh, do Eric, you, do you, Michael. Oh, sorry, Larry. Go. Eric, what I'm curious about 
what kind of starting set are you talking about a knife or two and one or two gouges you know three or four pieces or eight or nine pieces well understand that this if, if you're asking me it's going to be heavily favored toward the caricature side and so what i'm going to start with is a is one knife a mid-size v-tool a mid-size gouge and a fishtail uh car fishtail tool the fishtail tool allows you to switch back and forth from the carving knife to the fishtail. Yeah. The V tool allows you to do, I mean, you can do the things with the V tail V tool. You can also do with a knife. And so we show them how to do that with the V tool and with the knife. And then the gouge is just something that, you know, you're going to add wrinkles or hair, or whatever you use it. So basically we want to start with the four tools and that's what I have in my beginner set. You don't see them, but they're right over here. And there's there, I got a bucket, I got a, a, a tote with 10 sets of tools that I've gathered over the years. Some of them were given to me, some of them I bought. It has a, it has a knife, it has a, 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 v tool, a small V tool, and I think some of them may even have just a small uh, flat chisel that's really a, a, a three sweep. Has a gouge and has a, a V tool. And so those are real simple tools. Some of them I made, some of them from the old, you remember the old Warren tools that you pulled out, put yeah. another one in and you wanted to carve. So I just made those into a, you don't have to switch them, they're in a solid handle. Uh, that's what I started them with. That's what we started them with in the club. But, you know, if they're sitting next to somebody and I don't get to them, somebody will loan them a tool. And it's usually a knife of some sort because that's 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 what you're going to do most of your carving from it. And most of our caricature carvers in the club say you need to start with a knife because that's the most basic tool. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I've been thinking about putting together some sets uh, for beginners that want to drop in and don't have any. And uh, so there's been a discussion about whether that should be seven or nine pieces. And I thought we could get by with three or four. And so I appreciate your uh, reinforcing what I was uh, curious about. Thank you. So and Eric, let, me, uh, let me go ahead. No, uh, I I, I'll pull it out. Go ahead. Uh, there's a lot of interest in, always in backgrounds about tools, tool sources, tool preferences. How, how do you buy a knife? What kind of knives do you like? What kind of blades do you like? The same, the corresponding one is about wood. You know, everybody does is carving basswood, but do you, what kind of basswood do you like? Do you have a preference for it? Do you carve other things besides basswood for, you know, kind of beginner programs? So between knives, tools, and woods, there's kind of a, that's kind of a commonality that uh, unites us all. Yeah, right. True. I would agree with that 100%. I, I don't know if you're leading to a question. Do I have a preference? I, I don't. Okay. Um, I, I've i got Helby's. I've got OCC tools. I've got FlexCut. I've got a bunch of different tools. Lately, what I find myself gravitating to is FlexCut. I use FlexCut a lot because they're easy to sharpen, and they may not last a, 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 a edge as long as another tool. But, you know, I've got several of them and I'll just switch back and forth. And when I need to sharpen, I sharpen and when I need to carve, I carve. I don't know that I have a preference on tools, although um, by and large, Helvey has gotten a lot of a lot of publicity lately because of, of their marketing technique with just with just Holly and, 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 and Rich. It's amazing the, the, the traction they're getting. But Pinewood Forge does a does a superior knife as, as well. They do it in the short and the long. Uh, OCC tools has some great tools. I, I, I use a lot of flex cut because in class people say, what do you prefer? Well, I'm going to use flex cut because they're inexpensive. They're easy to maintain and they'll last you a good long while. So I, I don't know that I have a preference of tools um, because when I need a tool, I just reach and grab whatever's, whatever is sharp and not necessarily uh, a particular brand. So my preference of wood is basswood, although I just recently carved a bolo tie out of Tupelo, and I thought, man, that's that's good stuff to carve, but I don't know that I want everything out of Tupelo because it's it has flakiness to it, uh, so I don't know that I want everything done that way. So, But, yeah, I, I built those sets with four tools in them because I want, them to, I, I want people to understand that you're not going to spend $8,000 on tools. You're going to spend 100 bucks with a glove and a sharpening system and you're you're in business and then wood basswood is fairly inexpensive so that that to me is where i'm, I'm going i want to get them in and if i have to tell them they got to spend you know three or four hundred dollars i probably lost them especially the younger folks when you're retired 
and you, you're not spending money on a new couch every year or whatever because the kids tore it up, then you have a little bit of disposable income. But those that are still in their 20s and 30s chasing kids to soccer practice and scouts and whatever, they don't have a whole lot of extra money. So how can I get you in fairly inexpensively, simply with something that you can put into a small tool bag, tool roll, roll it up, take camping with you, make sharp stick or, or walking stick or whatever. Well, how do you get them to, to, the, to the actual doing the carving before they've spent, you know, Christmas money on, on the tools. So, yeah. So I, let me, I, I, yeah. Let me put you on the spot since this is a tips, a tips, a tips line kind of a thing. You, do you and the, your, your carvers in the club tend to buy basswood locally at a store or do you tend to buy a mail order from somewhere? What, um, do, you, what, do, you, what do you prefer? I prefer choosing my own. I don't like buying it out of out of my area and I don't like buying ones that I can't see. Having said that, I buy a lot of wood from our wood carving store, but you know, I have to be, I have to be very careful because I have to take a knife in with me. I have to test a corner of it to make sure that it's carvable because I bought some bad wood out of there and some of I had to take back and say I can't use this and they they have no question. It doesn't matter how much I've cut off, they give me a full refund on it. I just recently bought some from a guy in Salt Lake and I bought some from uh, Tim up at he Tim Heineke up at Heineke Woods and they, they always have superior wood. I never have to question the wood I get from Heineke. It's just shipping is very expensive. So we're investigating buying it from a local guy. Our, one of our, cl our club president, Larry Chris, buys it from his supplier over in Oregon and it's really, really good wood as well. So, um, I would I would hesitate telling anybody to buy wood off of off of eBay or Etsy or or Amazon, and I would hesitate to tell people to go over to Michaels or somewhere else like that that doesn't specialize in wood carving to buy tool, wood from there because it's generally not going to be the wood you want to really carve. It's it's a little bit harder, and that's that's what I hear on social media when someone posts, "Hey, I bought this wood. It's bass wood, and I can't carve it. It's really hard." And that's what you find out because there's different. There, wood grows differently in Wisconsin than it does in Florida. Yeah. So you're looking at basswood. You you can get some really bad basswood, and I don't want to turn anybody off. If you're new and you bought some basswood off of Amazon or e at eBay, you get it home and you can't carve it, you might quit. You might be done with it, and I don't want I, I don't want that to happen to anybody. So we don't necessarily go in and buy a bunch, although our club does. A club will buy some for the projects that we do. Uh, there's been times in the past when some of us have gotten together to save on shipping. We buy a box or, or we pick them up at a show when we go somewhere. Uh, but I've, I've lately been getting, I bought a bunch at the Utah Valley show because there's a guy down there that does it. He gets it all from Iowa or Wisconsin yeah. or wherever. And it was really good wood. So you have to be real careful about it. Well, well let me try this question. Larry, Larry Chris is online. I know, I only know Larry from zooming with him. Larry, I'll see if I can put you on the spot. You can say no, if you don't want to, but when, when Eric said you have a supplier in Oregon, I'm curious is that who that supplier is and where they might be. Uh, Eric is calling, he's calling up a memory is what he's doing. I used to get, uh. my, <laughs> get my stuff from Blue Ribbon and the stuff from Blue Ribbon was absolutely wonderful. Um, the, I'm getting some stuff these days from Iowa, but Eric and I are talking seriously about Salt Lake City because the truth of the matter is that uh, the truth of the matter is, oh, he says it's, he's been getting some good bass wood from High Desert. Did you know that, Eric? High Desert hardwoods? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Uh, but yeah, that's it's. Eric is absolutely right. You can turn off a, a carver real quick with bad basswood. Yeah. Or bad so this wood. Is, yeah, this is kind of like fishermen sitting around talking about where the fishing holes are, right? Where where to buy the good where to buy the good wood. That's the great one of the tragedies of the uh, the shows. You know, the, the pandemic is that the shows shut down. Some of us went to the Lincoln City show that was held every every year in January and really loved it, or the Salem show in April. And unfortunately, the Lincoln City show has got to, it was closed down again, but more rough outs was in, frequently came to uh, Lincoln City and you could see, touch, smell, feel, try it. And, you know, he had a really great reputation. 
so we we miss him. Thankfully, he came through town, and and a number of people bought some stuff from him. Order, you know, uh, special order. And Doug Rose will probably remember this when we did the Don Bayer show. Heineke, as a source, became, I think, it was Don's preferred source for buying for buying wood locally in Portland. I get asked. I ended up buying a lot of basswood. I ended up buying most of it from either Crosscut or Hardwood Industries. They're two of our big suppliers locally. They are commercial, not retail. We obviously can buy smaller blocks at Woodcrafters and Woodcraft, and you can you can see and touch it. But you know, they the price per board foot when you start buying them in, in quantities becomes uh, uh, way more affordable, and that's been acceptable not as good as some of the higher quality stuff that comes from the midwest upper midwest but still so acceptable i was able on our trip to salem i was able to buy some wood from everett coots there he had he had hosted pat and and pat moore when they came through he bought a whole lot of wood the stack was taller than i was and i was able to buy several pieces from him. and i'll tell you it was good wood whatever you get from from more rough outs it's going to be superior wood because they're up in that part of the northern plains where that wood grows, and so they've got a really good supply of it. If you if, if you if you if the moors come by your area at any time and stop somewhere, you can they they always have a truckload of, of wood, so they'll sell you. I'll also make a comment about woods because this is a Kelly Stadelman uh, tips and techniques. She taught massive numbers of classes. Almost all of her classes were not carved in basswood. They were carved in northern white pine from northern Idaho, which she was able to get by the truckload because at the time they were harvesting a lot of the fire burn apparently. And she said it was just, uh, she loved the wood. She carved and had her students carve a lot of that, even though she has carved some, a lot of stuff in basswood, but most of her students ended up carving northern white pine. Good stuff. Yeah, Eric, I sort of it's derail you on your your line of thinking. How are you doing in your outline? I'm good. We're, we've covered what we needed to cover, so I appreciate the time. Okay. So I'm looking at other questions here. Uh, Dave Wilcox from Garden Valley, Idaho, says I've been getting good basswood from High Desert uh, in out of Eagle, Idaho. Yeah. And they let it buy you by the board foot and several thicknesses. That's good. Maybe I'll stop there at Eagle on this weekend when I go by. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would love to promote Woodcraft, but uh, the last little bit, if I don't, if I buy it any thicker than one inch, I, I'm, I'm, you're, you're buying a pig in a poke, as we say in the South. You don't know what yeah. you're getting. So it, with yeah. the, with the one inch, you can see both sides of it, and you can see the depths. And I, so I use a lot of that for my relief carving. But if I have to buy bigger wood, and, and I've got plenty of it, I don't need any more. But I always buy good wood when I see it. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll definitely we're going to definitely explore this guy in, in or in uh, Utah, and if that works out, we'd be glad to pass on his name because he wants to he wants to he wants to hit all the shows. He's coming up to our show in April. Yeah, it's great, Eric. I have another question. This is from Roman Chernikov. Roman is in the Santa Bella Clary Santa Bella Santa Santa Clara Valley Carving Club. Sorry, Roman. <laughs> so it says, Eric, what do you think about whittling? and how it can be compared with flat plane carving. So uh, I, I was on the International Association of Wood Carving uh, some, some, uh, some weeks ago, and, and I told my carving story. And, and it starts in Alabama with my dad's father's brother who ran a store. And every time I went into that store, there was either, there was either men sitting around the table playing dominoes, because that's a contact sport in the South, or there was another guy always sitting around the, the pot belly stove with a knife and a piece of wood. And I never saw anything that he made that I can remember, but he always had a pile of chips around his feet. So to me, the way I look at it, whittling is one knife. And, and that could be whether you're making a sharp stick or whether you're making a walking stick or whether you're making a full figure or whatever. I've always understood whittling to be one tool, one one piece of wood, and you're carving with that. And then carving is using all the other tools. You can find you can find proponents for both sides of that argument. Um, I like whittling. To me, I'm just going to sit down with a piece of wood, and whatever comes out of that wood comes out. Whether it's a, a bolo tie for Boy Scouts, or if it's just a shelf sitter that I'm going to I'm going to give away, or one of the little owls that we do. 
I don't know that there's a, a real sharp distinction between either one of them, uh, but I'm, I'm primarily a knife carver, mostly. Uh, about about seventy percent of my carving will be done with a knife because I use that for removing the stuff. So whether that's whittling up to a point where I pick up another tool and then it's carving, I, I'm not. I teach science. I don't know that I'm that smart enough to draw hairs there. Would you care to but, comment about? Oh, oh different. I was going to switch topics. Would you care to talk about what you taught in Salem? What kind of projects you've been there more than once? Kind of are those. I've been there several years and the first time I went, they had seen a project that I taught up at Kennewick and they said, would you come do that in Salem? And I did. I came with one project, but it was different sizes. So I did a Viking. If you've ever, if you looked at my blog and seen what I've carved, it's, it's on, it's on one of those posts, but I did a, a, a short Vikings and tall ones. And, and so I brought different sizes of that. The next year they said they wanted something different. So they wanted, I guess, I guess the prevailing, mode of, of operation for traveling carving teachers is to bring a variety of projects and usually those are rough outs. I have never sold a rough out in terms of ones that I do. I do blanks so that way people can modify it their way. But that year I brought several different projects and then the ensuing years I've gone, I, I think I brought 24 projects this last year. I didn't have 10 of each. I had, you know, five or five, uh, as little as five and as many as, as, as 10 of each. Uh, but they wanted to do several things. And, and the big thing is people want to do gnomes and people want to do Santas and, and, and fun things. And so I brought the, the two main ones that I brought was a Santa carrying packages and a gnome with a stick and, and uh, not a gnome, sorry, a wizard with a marble in his hand and a, and a, and a, and a lamp and a lighted torch in his other hand. Those were the ones that most people wanted at that club. But I usually bring a variety of projects and that comes out of a conversation that we have over the year. What would you like to see? What do you want me to work on? I, I thought during the pandemic when Oregon said, you know, marijuana is legal, I thought I'd do a bunch of hippies. Nobody wanted to carve a hippie. I don't understand why. I thought Oregon would be all over that. but. Um, I've, I've got a lot of projects and I usually bring between four and eight or more uh, when I travel so that people have a variety of choices. They can choose the simple ones down here that might take you, you and I, four or five hours, a raw beginner all day. Um, I bring enough for everybody to keep busy from inter upper intermediate to, to beginner. Okay, we have time for questions. I'm going to unspotlight you. And Eric is through his outline, but this is an opportunity to ask questions, share information, share knowledge of any kind. I, I don't have a question, but another example of flat, flat play carving. Uh, that is in my collection. Take a look. It's very simple. Just a few cuts. This is a detail from both sides. And interesting, they use a piece of leather for, for the ears. And just very simple, this is from Switzerland. Thanks, Ron. I've got one similar to that, if I can find it real quick. Now that I say I want to find it, I probably won't, but... There we go. Similar to one you had there, Roman is a, a moose, very flat. And then the, the horns were just, they're, they're a, a piece of thin wood and then glued on the top. But that would be a, that would be a real simple one. I hesitate to do things like this for raw beginners because as thin as these legs are, they're gonna break them off. And so I, I hesitate to do things like that that are very, Fragile for uh, large for beginner carving uh, students. Understandable. Larry, going back to uh, woods, I, I don't know how many people have experimented with it, but recently I've been uh, doing a lot of uh, of my carvings out of uh, aspen, which is uh, is freely available as downed wood um, 
in in the, the forest. So uh, um, I've I've uh, found it to be very similar to basswood in terms of the, its carvability, maybe slightly harder, but not not significantly, and it takes detail really well. Um, I'm primarily a bird carver, so this is a, a recent um, carving out of aspen. Right. And, and wow. I've done some other things too, but but um, uh, I've done it for with with other kinds of, of projects as well, and it, it really works out well for uh, decorative carving. Uh, I've done done some uh, floral designs in in a, a little bench I made and things like that. So just a and D Doug, are you buying the wood. <laughs> are you buying the wood? Or are you uh, is it no I, I, uh, um, harvesting. I, I just watch for it where it's downed, uh, where it's in a place that can be harvested, and just take a chainsaw and <laughs> cut myself out a chunk of it. Now, sometimes you have to let it cure a little bit, but if you slab it off, and uh, and if you can quarter quarter saw it for even drying, uh, it it comes out uh, comes out really well. Yeah. Well, nice. Thanks for sharing that. I've used a bit of aspen because I do bolo ties for Boy Scouts and, and I have a certain number that I give away. And so using the bat, the aspen, if as long as it's not too old and too dried out, aspen is a wonderful wood to carve. I've, I've had some walking sticks where I let them dry for too long and they were they were hard. They were they get to the hardness of about a willow. So it's, it's a little bit harder to do it that way. Well, springboarding off of that, I'll chime in with I've done three or four projects now with green wood. And here in Oregon, on the west side of the state, our weed is the alder, and it's readily available. People burn it for firewood, but if I get a fresh cut, I, I've learned to really love cutting green wood, even if it's only two, you know, three-fourths done, and then let it dry so it won't crack and break. And, and as many of you may know, uh, chair makers used to go out into the woods and rough out their with their spring pole lathe and with their in shaves and ads and axes and they'd rough out parts in the woods with green wood and then leave the debris to lay but you know get it get it mostly done and then finish it and detail it after it dries some uh, I, I think there's a great opportunity to get people excited about that because it's relatively like butter compared to talking about how hard is that wood and how do you like working with it? If it's full of right. water, it carves easy. <laughs> I like the color of that alder. I, 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 I have a feeling it'll make some beautiful walking sticks. I want to cut some down next time I come through. When are you coming through next? Our, our next trip will probably be, other than vacation, will be in August when I go out to Salem again. Usually the first or second week of August. So your but, trips to Salem have been for the rendezvous, not for the show in the spring? No, I teach out there. Their show has been canceled for the last couple of years. And, and since I teach school, getting time off sometimes is real difficult. Yeah. I haven't been able to make it to the Lincoln City, haven't been to the to the, uh, to the, or, uh, the uh, Capitol Woodcarvers in Salem. I haven't been to their show, but uh, it's on the list. Well, I've been to the rendezvous the last uh, four or five years, and so I'll have to look for your name on the list of uh, instructors now that I've uh, had this introduction to you. Yeah, I'd love to come down there. It's it, it, For me, teaching high school, school starts at the end of August, so they tell you don't plan on taking any time off for the first month. So getting days off for, for coming over there for the rendezvous, which I, I, I've talked to Everett about that for you know a dozen years now, um, just haven't been able to get to, to it, but it's on the list. We're going to, see when, we met, when we met with Eric uh, this summer on his way to Salem, our model is to bring Eric here, produce a class taught in Portland. So, you know, we have a big population area here, and I think there would be enough people to, to to justify him coming and explore some of the things that he's uh, he can offer. And so hopefully that will be done. When he's on summer break from teaching, I suppose. Huh? Yeah, that, that three-day period between June and September, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're going to see how long that lasts because it, with, the, with the third year being in pandemic and having to wear a mask all day long at school and with the, all the pol politics and drama, I, uh, I, I'm ready to pull the plug and, and call it retirement and go off and do something else. But, we, you know, we'll see how the end of it. I always feel this way 
during the year. And at the end of the year, I'm like, oh, this was fun. I'll come back another year and you know, we'll see how that works. So, uh, I will make one show. And, um, let me show one show and tell here. Max gotcha. Sutter, you know, the uh, Western Woodcarvers Association met at the Western Forestry, now the World Forestry Center for 25 years until they didn't. And they used to have a Christmas tree every year, several Christmas trees. One of them was decorated with wood carvings. And that collection of wood carvings is in our possession. And oh. you know, Tony, Tony is here on the on the on the, uh, the 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 program tonight, and husbanded those for a long time. One of those was this little angel, and you may it may not show up, but it was carved by Max Sutter, and Max Sutter was the one of the four founders. And it turns out that his son gave me this larger version of that that his dad did by the gobs for, and they just carved these. And they were really simple carvings. Some of them, you know, you can see the, that's not flat, flat plane, that's just the side of the board, right? And then they would glue on the, uh, the uh, thing. I asked him if his dad invented that, and he said, I don't know, this is uh, the son. And in, in a 1973 Boy Scout wood carving handbook, there was that pattern, right? So Mac was big in the Boy Scouts. Eric was big in the Boy Scouts. I was big in the Boy Scouts. I can't say I did anything with wood carving other than carving an order of the arrow kind of a thing or some little neckerchief slide. But, you know, at the time, you know, that became a, the bola became a, a, a thing. And today, you know, I would say we need to find some equivalent, probably related to a smartphone or some object that can actually be ubiquitous that we can play uh, whatever it is, right? That, uh, right. that becomes, you, gotta, you gotta add one, you gotta make your own. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Before we leave, if you don't mind, you don't mind if I show my card? It's, uh, I, I just got new, um, new business cards. And so it has my, if you want to take a screenshot of that, it has my email, my new carving website, phone number there. And then I've got Eric, the Instagram and YouTube if you want that. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll do better than that. I, I have a copy of that card. I will scan it and put it in the post program handout. Gotcha. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate you doing that and sharing. And uh, Eric is donating a bunch of old back copies of uh, Chip Chats magazine, which I'll pick up this weekend when I'm visiting my daughter. And so it'll add to the library. We'll have duplicates of some of these and the rest of them will be passed on to guild members. Uh, so uh, we're trying to build that library. Eventually, we, I got to figure out a way to get it out uh, in, so it can become useful and people can access it. Let me just scan if there's any uh, other questions. Okay, Eric, thank you very much for your time. This, you know, an hour later, and for Larry and for Doug, to you guys showing up, and for Dave, I guess, uh, in Garden Valley, yeah, uh, for you know having some Ido representatives too. But I really appreciate it. Um, we do these programs. We do these programs once a month, except December. And uh, we record them. So even if you register and can't make it, you can, they're always on the website. So that will be that will be true here. Okay. If you have any uh, feedback for any of this, for ideas for the future, let me know. Uh, for future programs, send me. You got my email address, folks. Uh, but otherwise, we'll see you either online. Uh, I will put a plug in. We've been a group of us have been doing what I call carving conversations but Mondays at 9 a.m. They're open forums. There's about half a dozen of us that usually join, uh, not always the same half dozen, run for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. It's an amazing set of topics that come up. It's all unstructured. The only agenda is no agenda. And I put a link to that uh, or a reference to that in the last newsletter and it's open to anybody. So if you want to participate in those conversations, share the knowledge that's uh, that's available to you okay with that we'll say good night i'll, I'll uh, wrap up the recording and uh, we'll see everybody down the road eric take care thank you eric thank, thank you. you guys nice meeting y'all
Thank you. Bye.